I have been coming up here for not quite a decade, uh, and thank you very much to the Yukon Mining Alliance. Uh, come here in the summers. I've actually come here a couple times in the winter. I've come up here on other trips, just not YMA related. But um, I, I'm from you know I'm from the U.S. I work with this Paradigm Group. It used to be Agora Financial. They're down in Baltimore, so it's like Baltimore. That's a long way from the Yukon. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, but it's worth the trip because there is just so much to see up here and so much to do, so much to learn, uh, and so many opportunities. Uh, and uh, again, I'm so grateful uh, to, to be here. Anne called me and when we were talking about coming up this year. She said, would, would you give a talk? And I'm thinking, well, okay, I can give a talk. Then I thought, oh, you're the keynote speaker at lunch. And I'm like, oh for, oh, for God's sakes. I mean, I'm standing between you and lunch. That's a terrible place to be, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, this is a nice place. It's got great people, lots happening, whether you're a geologist or not. You know, I mean, we, uh, uh, this is just a wonderful part of the world. Uh, and I, I say that as a Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania guy who, you know, I'm an American, but I, I love the Yukon, the people, what happens up here. It's just a terrific, terrific place. Uh, we heard a ter an outstanding uh, summary this morning uh, from the uh, Yukon Geologic Survey, which truly put a lot of things in perspective. Uh, uh, you know, for me, I've been studying the Yukon for years, and I, I, I was learning so much this morning just listening uh, and listening to what's going on. Um, after 10 years, uh, you, you can connect some, I call them Yukon dots, you know, and I'll get into each one of these uh, in a few minutes here, but uh, the, the value proposition up here is rising. You know, I mean, it's, uh, as, a, as an outsider, you know, coming in as somebody who writes newsletters, and I'm a geologist with background, but I mean, I, you know, so I kind of know what I'm talking about, I like to think, you know. Uh, but uh, we're just, we're dealing with better and better knowledge of the basic science and the economic geology behind it all. Uh, obviously, happily, the prices for the metals are higher. Uh, the world needs what the Yukon has to offer. Uh, compared with many, many other places, Yukon is looking better and better. And you can get here, you can work here, you can get things done. Um, and I'll go into each of these things in, a, in, a, you know, in the next few slides here. Uh, for 125 years, I like to say that the Yukon has been prospected, uh, but it's far from explored. Uh, I think the, ge the geos in the room will get that. Uh, uh, you know, the non-geos, you probably get it too because you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't, if you didn't have some sense of what's going on. Uh, somewhere, someplace, sometime, somebody, you know, some guy with a hat and a pick and a mule or a canoe or whatever went up the stream and was picking around looking for something. You know, they saw something, they went up the hill to see where it came from. Um, it, so it's been prospected pretty, pretty well, although there are still things out there that, that you find. I mean, what we heard this morning about you know, exciting copper discoveries, there's gold discoveries. I mean, there, there are things I remember, um, I think it was you know, uh, one of the first trips up here, uh, went to the Three Aces project that's been around for, you know, it's been around for geologic time, but nobody had ever walked up to some of those outcrops and whacked them with a hammer and looked at visible gold in the quartz, you know, because uh, that's one of the first we heard of it. But today, there's so much going on with, uh, with advanced technologies, you know, remote sensing, everything from those little buzzy drones that you hear that sound like a swarm of mosquitoes, all, you know, to, to everything else you can do from an airplane, from a really high airplane, from satellites in space. The geophysics is astonishing. The geochem is astonishing what they can do, you know, parts per trillion. Uh, the software that allows you to process this information, get things done, the, si the signal processing, big data, artificial intelligence, there is so much that's, that you can throw at a problem anymore that you couldn't do. You know, pick a number, 10 years, 15, 20, 30. You know, you hear these stories about the old timers, oh yeah, this was first discovered in the 50s or the 60s. Man, that was, that's like Pliocene time in terms of technology of uh, what there is. And then out in the field today, much better tech. I mean, we hear stories about you can, you know, phone, phone it in, literally you can phone it in. Uh, you got portable internet that, you know, can go on, uh, on uh, Elon Musk's uh, satellites up there. Uh, better comms, better, better, better ways to transport things, the safety level, the helicopters, the airplanes, the things that you can do today that just weren't there, better drilling rigs, better drill bits, there's so much out there. And there is so much left to uh, explore over and above the prospecting. The curve is rising, uh, and it's a mix of everything. It's, it's academia, it's government, it's industry. I mean, again, this morning we heard a fabulous talk from the Yukon uh, 
Geologic Survey. Uh, really, they do terrific work. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the academic geology has, has done so much in, in industry. And there's this mix back and forth of people. You know, the, the college professor, you know, is, consults with the, with the big mining company or, you know, you know, the mining company guy leaves and goes and becomes a, you know, a government scientist. The government scientist goes into academia. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's so much to learn. Um, and uh, we, are, we are just in early innings, really, in terms of where this is going, because the momentum of uh, knowledge is increasing so much. Meanwhile, metal prices are higher in the last 10 years. Uh, we, we had a decade of doldrums, you might say, but then, holy smokes, whoa, you know, I mean, uh, copper's up, gold's up, silver's up. I mean, just think of all those days in the 2010s when you would wake up and say, what's the price of silver? Oh, for God's sakes, 12 bucks an ounce. Oh, now what, you know? Um, look at it now, you know, there are days it's 32, 34 bucks an ounce in China, and then, you know, then in New York, they slam it all down with the paper, um, the paper pushers, but, uh, you know, there is definitely a trend there. The, the, the price is there to support, to support it. And then, of course, the world needs what the Yukon has, you know, I mean, you know, gold, silver, copper, lead, zinc, everything, you know, all the critical metals. I mean, a slide here, I, I don't like eye chart slides. This is maybe the closest one we'll get to that. But, you know, it's all the usual metals, you know, more copper, more lithium, more nickel, more cobalt, more, that, more you know, I mean, you want to do solar panels, you need silver. It's just, it, it's all, it's all there. Um, and uh, the world, the, you know, the world needs it. Canada needs it. The U.S. needs it. Uh, compared with the rest of the world, the uh, Yukon, it just, it just looks better and better and better. I mean, this is a map of political risk in the world. I mean, there are many similar maps that you can see, but you know, lots of, lots of sp spots that are sort of shaded there where you really don't want to work. And as a newsletter guy who's, done, who's made a lot of trips to a lot of different continents, you know, I can tell you that there, there are really good reasons why you might not want, not want to work some places. I mean, you get along and you, know, you go there and you come back and you're still in one piece. But... Uh, uh, I mean, there, there are, you know, I won't get into it from the stage, but there are countries in the world where, you know, I, I, I wouldn't put one dime. I would not put, I would not give them, I wouldn't give them five minutes of my time or one dollar of my investment money um, because I don't trust them and I can't trust them. And, but uh, Canada, yeah, Yukon, definitely, absolutely, you know. And uh, I mean, you can get things done. You, you can get things done uh, in uh, the Yukon. Let's skip a chart here. Uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. But I want to I want to think ahead here, and um, I want to talk about a couple of curves. I want to talk about three different curves um, that that control your life, uh, because a lot of things seem linear in the world. You know, We're just more, this, this, this. You know, more of this, more of that, more of this. You know, but not that's not how things work. More is not necessarily better. You know, you, you're, you can have logarithmic growth, you can have exponential growth, you can have long-tailed curve growth. And let me get into that a little bit. Um, and for many years, Yukon has been an exploration story. You know, and it's the same story. It's kind of like year after year after year. You know, VRIC, Vancouver Resource Conference, Roundup, you know, PDAC, you know, BMO Conference, the Beaver Creek, and, I, and you know, we can name more and more. There's a way of doing things. We're dialing for dollars all the way, you know, you're not, you know, and just trying to raise that next couple million bucks so I can fund the drilling campaign next year. We're going to do some more exploration, more of this, more of that. Um, okay, that's been the way it's been, but we're starting to see more of that big mining money come in here. And that's, that's different than the dialing for dollars money. It's one thing when you're you know, trying to talk high net worth individual into writing a check for 100000 or 250000 or something like that. It's another thing when you know, some big company come in and just, yeah, I, I want to see some results here. Here's 20 million bucks, you know. Okay. Um, you raise it, you spend it, you explore, you add ounces and pounds, rinse and repeat year after year after year. The Yukon, it's, it's been a story like that for a long, long time. Sure, every now and then something gets built, but an awful lot of the story has been an exploration. But you want to be aware of biases. Everybody has biases. You know, there's anchoring bias, normalcy bias, recency bias. You know, anchoring bias would be like, you know, if, 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 if you only knew about hockey by watching the Toronto Maple Leafs, you would have a certain bias about hockey, now wouldn't you? You know, um, but 
it, you know, you, you walk down the street and you see a really big guy in a fight with a little, little small guy, and your, your normal bias is, why is that big guy beating up on a little guy? Well, maybe the little guy started the fight, you know, okay. Uh, the same thing with, uh, uh, the same thing in business, the same thing with working in a place like the Yukon, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, boy, this is an exploration place, we go up here to explore, well, okay, and then the normalcy bias, the recency bias, you know, again, more of the same, every year, dial for dollars, have a drill program, and you're constrained much by the weather and the seasonality of it, I mean, you pretty much know that not too much will happen after about, oh, you know, the end of September, maybe you can, some really, aggressive people work into October, November, you know, but by the middle of winter, this place shuts down and it doesn't, you know, start back up until, you know, till the spring. It's hard to operate, you know, for many, numerous months of the year. Um, but it'd be, so be aware that we're living in this sort of linear perception, okay? But then, uh, this exploration bias of the Yukon um, makes you ask, are you ready for what could be coming ahead. Where is the Yukon, you know? If some of something is good, is more of it better, you know? I mean, are there diminishing returns? Let's use a simple example. You run a restaurant, and you've got a cook in the kitchen. You think, if I hire another cook, I can make more food. Well, okay, yeah, you probably can. If I hire two more cooks, three more cooks, four more, am I gonna make more and more food, or am I going to crowd the place, crowd the kitchen so much that nobody can get anything done? Um, if I'm a regulatory agency, if some regulation is good, is more regulation better? Should I hire more bureaucrats to write more regulations? Should I, should I hire, you know, more people to, you know, oversee everything? Well, you know, you, know, you look at look at academe, you look at look at universities around the world. I, um, you know, they have professors and they have administrators. But what's growing in universities in the North America, in the U.S. and Canada? The professors are all pretty st stable. There's not, a, there's not, we're not growing the number of professors. But look at the administrators, you know, and now, now look at the condition that the universities are in. They're terrible. You know, the North American academe is falling apart. Apply that to whatever it is you do, whether it's running a company or whether it's working for the government, whether it's as an investor, you know, what do you see going on? Are there diminishing returns from more of whatever's happening? And at the same time, you've got exponential growth. We are, uh, when I say we, you know, we're in this sort of normalcy bias, it's, I don't have a pointer, so I'll use my hand. It's one thing to be on the low part of that, that curve, you know? It's another thing when that curve starts to move up because there's a difference between early and later on curves like this. And when the big money starts to come in, the big outside big mining money, the big huge investment money starts to come in, you know, I guess the question is, are you ready for it? Now you're probably out there saying, oh, I run a company, I'm ready for it, write me those checks. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. Uh, but we're in the Yukon, which is, far away, it's way up north, it's very seasonal, and there's a lot of big things that are gonna happen here, they're, they're inevitable. We've already, this has already been a boomtown environment, I mean, we're right in the middle of it, you know, I mean, they, they, they built an entire tourist industry out of the old boomtown heritage of, of Dawson City, for example. But there's basic stuff that has to happen, whether you're in Whitehorse, or whether you're in Dawson City, or whether you're anyplace else along the way. I mean, you know, you know just basic things that, you know, well, this is what the government takes care of. Well, it's, it's what everybody needs to take care of. You know, is there enough energy? We've had this discussion. Um, uh, Premier Rands the other night was talking about, you know, power lines, or we were at Western Copper yesterday, we were talking about power lines, and, you know, uh, and just, just, you know, how do you, get, how do you get fossil fuels up here to heat the place and, you know, to run your diesel generators? Uh, I'll, I'll share a story that um, I heard down in, down in Whitehorse. Um, th th there's a Ford dealer down there who sells a lot of electric vehicles, and what happens is that people buy EVs in Whitehorse, EVs, and they go home, and they plug them in, and they start drawing amps out of the system, amperes, and down on the other side of town, the diesel generators kick in to, to supply the electricity to, to, to charge up the EVs. So, you know, I mean, basic things, basic, you know, energy, power, you know, 
more and more people coming up here. How do you get the food here? What about the water and the sewage, the housing, the communication, the roads, the schools, the medical? All of these things are things that you have to worry about, whether you're running your company, whether you're an outside investor, certainly if you're on the political side, if you're on the policymaking side. Uh, there's a lot of boomtown history here. And that's an example of what happens on the far side of one of those, uh, on, uh, one of those exponential curves. You know, you go from being a little town in the middle of nowhere to being a town of 40,000 in a matter of, you know, just you know, a year or two years. Um, be you know, be be careful because that that could be coming down the road. And then, are you ready for things that have long tails? That's another thing. You know, it's a it's you know, it's a, it, you know, we have front loaded events. You know, oh, we have a discovery here. Oh, we're gonna you know, the the nineteen you know, much of the twentieth century in the Yukon was you know had you know. People came in and they, they mined the veins, they mined what they could do, they built, they built a town or they built a mine or whatever. Um, and they, that 80-20 that rule, that Pareto 80-20 uh, rule, if they got 20% of everything, you know, or they got 80% of everything in the first, say, 20% of the time, and you're left with a long tail. That long tail, for example, the, you know, the environmental uh, legacy is the long tail of everything. You know, it's a, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of long-tailed things that, uh, that happen here. You know whether it's uh, excuse me whether whether it's a place like Keno Hill, which you know uh, was a I guess I'll use a U.S. term, it was an, like an EPA Superfund site, and then you know Clint Nauman and Alexco came in, got the contract to clean up the you know legacy pollution, and then they turned that into Alexco, you know the silver play. But I mean there there are things that have long tails, and so you want to be careful that either you understand your long tail, or that you can control what kind of a long tail you're going to make. Uh, or that if you're in the business of dealing with long tails, that, that you understand what that is. And, and, and I'm, you know, I, this is just a lunchtime talk here. I, I'm not going to go into deep, deep details. But, um, but anyhow, those are the things I just wanted to leave you with. You know, we have, if, coming up here again and again over the years, you know, both on you know, at the YMA invitation and on my own, on my own dime, you know, that of my publisher buying the airline ticket and stuff, uh, it's just been a pleasure. I love it up here. It's beautiful. I love the people. I love dealing with everybody I deal with up here. There's so many fabulous stories to tell uh, of what's happening, you know, the hard work, the intelligence, the dedication, the discipline, the, you know, and, but, but you do it in this sort of enjoyable uh, environment where people get along and they work together and, you know, and it's just so different to what you see in so many other parts of the world. I assure you, I've been, you know, it's where I live, you know, and, uh, uh, and so it's so nice to be up here, but it's also, I think we might be at sort of the turning points of a couple of those curves, you know, that diminishing return aspect, be careful of that curve, be careful when that curve flips, flips over, don't let that be you. And, you know, down here as the exponential starts to kick in, figure out where you are on that curve or the long tail, figure out what it is you're doing and what's the tail that you're going to leave behind. And with that, I'll just say that it's been a great 10 years. Um, and what about the next 10? It's as good as you make it. And uh, I hope that we are all around to benefit and enjoy from it greatly. And with that, I thank you for your attention and for being here and for being who you are and what you do. Thank you. <laughs>